Of all the sea's creatures, none have influenced our thinking more than the great whales. Against a backdrop of increasing environmental concern and their own brush with near extinction, the largest of the whale species have become larger than life symbols of numerous campaigns to protect the environment. Whales became a, a symbol for the whole environmental movement because it was so dramatic what was happening to them way back in the 1960s that a lot of people got interested in a lot of environmental problems, first of all because of, of fighting for these, these amazing creatures. The direction of policy on commercial whaling, it's informed by both scientific management and by public opinion. The fact is that the government is answerable to the electorate. But the nature of public opinion is often unclear, and attempts to gauge it can ignore important issues, such as whether simply protecting all whale species is really the best approach. The current stalemate in the IWC is really in nobody's interest, including the whales. The IWC is fast becoming irrelevant, um, certainly in terms of broader wildlife management issues. While we continue with the protectionist stance of no compromise, there's a very strong possibility that the IWC will break apart. And unless something can be done very quickly to pull it back from the brink, I think they're in real trouble. Indeed, for some, there is growing concern that we may now be sacrificing more effective international wildlife management in return for little more than a greener shade of whale. Since the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Environment in Stockholm, where the United States proposed a 10-year ban on whale hunts, the most publicly followed environmental debates often have focused upon the great whales. Through films, books, and public campaigns, whales have gradually taken on a very special status, leaving many convinced of the need for these creatures never again to be hunted. Whales have become our environmental symbol for saving the world. Those of us who have seen whales eye to eye have found or believe that they are persons. And therefore, we have a greater family of life on Earth, that we are not alone. I think it is wrong to kill whales because, I don't know, there's not many of them left. I don't know why they want to kill them. And they're lovely. To me, killing anything is, is, no, is, is wicked. Yeah. There's alternatives to uh, eating whale meat. People don't need it. My opinion of whaling is it's a very sad story and it should cease. It's cruel. But for some, whales, in spite of their size, are basically no different to the many other animals we consume as food. If it's part of their traditional culture and uh, they're not taking too many whales, then I don't have a big problem with it. I think anything in moderation is all right. You know, okay. Fishing and um, hunting of animals. I mean, we all eat meat, eat whale meat. Sure. No, I don't think it's wrong to hunt whales. Well, it's so different eating a cow in it at the end of the day. Like. The minke, a whale generally recognized as unendangered and traditionally hunted only for its meat, is now being taken in small numbers for food by Norway and also by Japan under its scientific research program. For locally based whalers in these and other countries, small takes of whales for food and research are no different to the many other mammals killed each year for similar reasons. クジラが可哀想やからとかクジラが賢いだとかだからこの人はダメとかそういう賢いとかそういうことは牛にも豚にも適用されることであって何もクジラだけの問題じゃないと思いますみんなあの弁当箱持ってたでしょ朝ごは
これはもう昔から大変に伝わってる小型沿岸捕鯨なんですよねそ,そこが私は納得いかないこの国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の国の The Commission's annual meetings have become a battleground where ideas and views are exchanged in much the same way that boxers trade punches. The Whaling Commission has been in a state of not regulating commercial whaling ever since it passed the moratorium. Whaling is going on on a more or less commercial basis. Norway is catching whales, Japan is catching whales for research purposes. Both of those are completely legal. And permitted activities, but they're not under international control. The thing to remember when you're trying to give advice on whaling or managing any natural resource is that it's not an exact science, it's not physics. There's an inevitable risk involved. The level of risk you're prepared to accept. Is, is colored by your philosophical and your political beliefs about the activity. What we're trying to do in the scientific committee is take out as much as possible of this political view by taking uncertainty explicitly into account with simulation models so that you can actually really measure what the risk might be under different circumstances. The IWC adopted the current moratorium in order to more accurately assess stock numbers. And develop a new management program capable of taking uncertainty into account and ensuring safe hunting quotas. After almost a decade of work, the Scientific Committee chose a system created by British scientist Justin Cook, which manages limited hunting of baleen whale populations on a species by species, stock by stock basis. This new system, known as the Revised Management Procedure, or RMP, takes account of uncertainty by allowing for errors of up to 50% in the sighting surveys used to estimate individual whale populations. The RMP also uses conservative estimates of reproduction within various stocks, plus past catch records, to calculate sustainable catch limits. The RMP is a scientifically based system for determining safe limits to whaling so as to ensure that any future commercial whaling would be sustainable and that there would be no risk to whale populations of overhunting. The RMP differs from previous attempts to manage whale stocks in several ways, one of which is it only、uh, makes use of data which we know are obtainable, and secondly, it provides Specific rules for determining what levels of catch are safe based on these data. So, once the data are available, there's little need to discuss what level of catch would be safe. The revised management procedure is essentially a, a safe way to calculate catches. And the reason we can say it's safe is because we've used computer whales. It's much easier to wipe out computer whales without having a guilty conscience. And we simulate all the different kinds of Scenarios that we can imagine to do with、um, almost anything abundance estimates wrong, number of catches wrong, environmental conditions changing dramatically, disasters happening so the population falls by half in a single year. And we run the model and see if our way of calculating the catch limits is safe and will cope. The RMP is incredibly conservative by comparison with the way we manage the world's fish resources. Even in cases where we manage fish resources well, we are far less conservative than the RMP. If you applied the RMP standards to fisheries resources worldwide, there are very few, if any, well managed fisheries that would survive with any catch being taken at all. <laughs> 
some countries in these debates, they have put themselves in corners where there is very little room for debating actually, for going towards other countries and so it's very difficult for them to move. The battle to continue protecting all species of whales is most aggressively waged by animal rights and some environmental groups, in addition to a coalition of largely Western governments who see whale watching as the only acceptable use of these animals. Opposing the moratorium in the IWC is a minority of governments, most notably Japan, Norway and Iceland, who strongly support a limited return to whaling under IWC control. For these traditional whaling countries, whales like the Minky symbolize long-held traditions and cultural values they are determined to maintain. To date, the work of the Scientific Committee on the Comprehensive Assessment and the RMP is yet to be put into practice. This ongoing delay is the result of wide divisions within the IWC over what the goals of whale management should be under the broader political control of the revised management scheme. I think the, the revised management scheme means different things to different people. For some people, they would take a, a rather shall we say superficial approach that you just look at the number of whales that are caught uh, make sure that that doesn't exceed the the, the regulated number and, and so on other people have uh, concerns for a much deeper analysis of what is going on that there is no possibility of a, an illegally caught whale entering into the market chain that the whales have been caught in as humane a manner as possible now not everybody agrees that all these things should be built in and of course there is a suspicion on the part of the pro-whaling uh, side of the argument that the people who are raising all kinds of difficulties and wanting all kinds of extra inspection are doing this just to delay the process and prevent it moving forward. My feeling is that if countries had a willingness to reach an agreement it could be done over a two three day meeting. The IWC has remained deadlocked over the moratorium for more than a decade, and despite media reports each year predicting a return to commercial whaling, there is little to suggest any compromise is likely concerning the revised management scheme and its various catch monitoring provisions. It's always anti-whaling side who come up with some kind of a new proposal, and almost always those proposals are either outside of the scope of the International Whaling Commission or has no scientific basis. So it's only natural for us to uh, cannot accept those proposals. Only reason we can think of is they are proposing those new proposals to delay the process. We don't accept that there have been delays in the uh uh, discussions on the RMS. In fact, it was 1994 when the first proposals were put forward and we've participated actively in the Commission, every one of the Commission's discussions on that topic since then. The charge that we have delayed its introduction is complete nonsense. Today we have good scientific evidence to the, uh, to the abundance of many whale stocks, especially mink whales in all oceans. And there is no scientific reason to keep the moratorium. It's quite clear within the IWC that there are two strong and very, very uh, opposing camps. Uh, on the one hand, you have some nations who believe that you can catch whales sustainably, and I would suggest that the science is probably on their side. Um, and they believe that for a whole range of cultural and traditional reasons, and perhaps economic reasons, they should be allowed to do so. On the other hand, however, we have a lot of nations, many of whom were traditionally whaling nations, but of course that's over 20 or 30 years ago. And they are taking a very strong political stand against whaling, uh, because of course there's no political mileage in doing anything otherwise. Popular support for ending commercial whaling 
came as a response to the excessive large-scale commercial hunting of the first half of the 20th century. The opening of the Antarctic to whaling in the early 1900s, followed by the introduction of a new hydrogenation process for using whale oil in the production of margarine, provided the whaling industry with both access to a huge number of whales and unprecedented demand for its product. By the late 1930s, demand for whale oil had taken its toll. The major whaling nations, Great Britain, Norway, Japan, Germany, and to a lesser extent the United States, South Africa, and the Soviet Union, had depleted right humpback and blue whale populations around the globe. More and better regulation of whaling, however, was still many years away. There was a limit initially on how much whaling could take place from the land. There was a limited amount of land. And so in the 1920s, the Norwegians came up with the idea of having floating factory ships where the whale was taken on board the big factory ship, cut up and the oil processed out. And so there was uh, a great opportunity for many companies to send down whaling fleets to get as much oil as they could. And the net effect of that was that so many whales were caught in the 1930 season that more oil was produced than could be sold in the world in that one year. World War II crippled many industries and whaling was no exception. Some whaling did continue in the Antarctic and off South Africa, but it greatly reduced levels. Many ships and floating factories were either converted for military service or destroyed by enemy raids. But this short respite was not enough to prepare the already heavily taxed stocks for the onslaught that was to occur after the end of the war. By 1945, much of Europe and Japan had been left in ruins and food shortages, in particular fats, were widespread. Demand for whale oil was again set to climb, and in response, the whaling companies, with strong support from their governments, made ready once again to set sail for the Antarctic. By the late 1940s, the stage had been set for what would soon become one of the most intensive periods of hunting ever. <laughs> In the post-war years, the clearly demonstrated economic muscle of the United States had made it a major force in international affairs. The Americans were instrumental in creating a number of international treaties and regimes, including plans to reform whaling regulation. A 1946 conference in Washington modified earlier international agreements on whaling and continued earlier established bans on humpbacks, right whales, and mothers with calves. Known as the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling, this new agreement became the founding treaty for the International Whaling Commission. The IWC held its first meeting three years later in London in 1949, setting an annual Antarctic quota, but also raising the ban on humpbacks. The IWC's brief was to conserve whale stocks in order to promote the orderly development of the whaling industry. However, what occurred during the first 15 years of the IWC's existence was far from orderly. And it was during this time that the greatest damage to stocks was inflicted by the five Antarctic nations, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, Japan, the Netherlands, and Norway. Japan was brought in by the United States occupation forces because they wanted protein. The Norwegians and the British wanted oil. No one could control the Soviet Union and they decided to get in on the business. And uh, the Netherlands came in in a small way uh, because they were interested in the oil business as well. So we had five countries and they operated under 
what the IWC could grant, which was a total quota. It made no sense economically to harvest whales with low quotas because the cost of fishing for whales was very high. That means that they had to fight for shares. In order to get bigger shares, all the countries had to increase the number of ships, increase the number of catcher boats, increase their efficiency, and so on. The amount of effort to catch a fixed number of whales was increasing all the time. And that started what we called, at the time, the Whaling Olympics. The main cause of the overhunting which led to the Whale Olympics was an excessively large quota, prompted by high demand, roller coaster like whale oil prices, and the use of the now infamous blue whale unit as a means of measuring the number of whales taken. The amount of oil from a blue whale was about the same as you got from two fin whales, from two and a half humpbacks, or six sirens. All of the oil from the different species can be mixed in, in the baleen whales, but it did mean that the output of oil could be regulated by the numbers of whales that we took of the different kind. During the 1950s, whaling became a race against time to catch the largest number of whales faster than anyone else before the quota was filled. And since catching the biggest whales was the quickest way to do so, the blue and fin whales were the first choice of every fleet. When the whaling fleets were down in the Antarctic, they knew that there was a limit to the number of whales that could be taken in any one season. For example, 16,000 blue whale units. And so each operation wanted to get the largest share possible of those 16,000 blue whale units. Catching one blue whale uh, was a lot easier than catching six side whales, for example, for the same amount of oil. Faced with growing financial pressures from overinvestment and dwindling catches, the five whaling nations continued to avoid risking profits by agreeing to a lower quota, or even a system of national quotas, as had been proposed by Norway as early as 1956, in spite of dire warnings of overhunting from many in the scientific committee. In the 1950s, Pretty well everybody agreed that the blue whales were declining very rapidly, but the well, fin whales, the next biggest whale, were the most important whale by then in the catches in the Antarctic. And there was a big controversy about whether they were also declining and how fast. Most scientists, particularly the British and Norwegians, thought they were declining quite fast. Others, the Dutch, the Japanese and the Russians, didn't really accept that argument and they, were, they all emphasized the uncertainty in, in all this. And in fact, um, the numbers were very unclear. But that uncertainty allowed countries to resist reducing the quotas. This tactic was used repeatedly by most of the Antarctic nations, in particular the Dutch delegation, which consistently opposed quota reductions throughout the 1950s until the Netherlands finally sold off its whaling interests to Japan in the mid-1960s. The Netherlands uh, in those 1950s, early 60s period were very anxious with their one whaling operation to get as many whales as they could, as much profit as they could. And so they argued very often that in the absence of scientific knowledge, you should do what you think best. And they thought that catching more whales was best for them. And everybody else, of course, had to go along because if, if one country decided to catch more, everybody needed to catch more in order to, to stay in place. A key figure in the use of uncertainty arguments to undermine warnings that fin whale numbers were dropping was Dutch biologist E.J. Schleiper. There was one Dutch scientist, Professor Schleiper, who was a very eminent whale biologist. I think he was mainly an anatomist, and he wrote a very good book on whales in the early 60s. It's not clear to me what he was actually up to. I don't know, and I wouldn't like to defame him in any way. But certainly, um, the sort of stories that I heard when I first came into it, which was in the early 60s, was that something funny was going on. 
However, by the time I was involved, uh, there was a thing called a committee of three uh, that was appointed, and they were looking at the data as best as it can be produced, and it was quite clear that things like fin whales and blue whales were going down very quickly. The appointment of three scientists from outside the IWC, Sidney Holt, K. Radway Allen, and Douglas Chapman, who became known as the Three Wise Men, was a turning point for the IWC and its treatment of scientific advice. By using population models and statistical analysis methods recently developed for fisheries management, Holt, Allen, and Chapman, with the help of fellow scientist John Gullin, were able to provide compelling evidence that the Antarctic stocks of fin, humpback, and in particular blue whales were indeed in accelerated decline. Part of the package deal was the scientific advice would be acted upon, even if it was not very nice to hear. And secondly, that the Commission would try to make whaling sustainable, which they had not ever confronted before. The increasing scarcity of large whales in the Antarctic finally convinced the Commission to follow scientific advice and reduce the quota in the 1963-64 season. The five Antarctic nations, after nearly a decade of discussion, also had reached agreement on a national quota system. But by this stage, it was too late to save Antarctic whaling from collapse. Britain and the Netherlands cut their losses by selling their quotas to Japan, while Norway maintained its quota but stopped hunting. By 1968, Japan and the USSR were the only nations operating in the Antarctic or elsewhere on a large scale. Following the collapse of the Antarctic stocks and the withdrawal of all but two of the major whaling nations from the industry, Japan and the USSR, the scientific committee was able to play a more influential role. And although the new willingness in the IWC to listen to scientific advice resulted in the abandonment of the Blue Whale Unit, the scientific committee's newfound influence was, however, to be short-lived. Radical changes in the Commission's direction and purpose, inspired by the past excesses of the whaling industry and the growing influence of environmental groups, were now on the IWC agenda. A new chapter in the IWC's struggle to regulate whaling was about to begin. In addition to the World Wildlife Fund, which first began attending IWC meetings in the late 1960s, Greenpeace was one of the first environmental groups to publicize the plight of the great whales. Many Western governments soon came under strong international and domestic pressure to push, on the basis of continuing uncertainty in the scientific data, for the complete protection of all species, a proposal which went against the advice of many in the scientific committee. I'm pretty sure the scientific committee either had a consensus or there was a majority saying a mor blanket moratorium was not scientifically justifiable. Uh, that this was to some extent a return to providing advice not on species by species or stock by stock but on whales in general. And most scientists I'm pretty sure by then would have said that was not the appropriate way to go. The majority of them wanted to regulate whaling in a, a sustainable way, in a, a fashion that would allow catching, if it was to take place, not to result in over-exploitation. But there were some scientists who um, took a more, what should we say, political view, that they saw the only way to achieve this objective of not causing further depletion was to have uh, a total ban on whaling. Um, that was not a scientific judgment in, in just those terms, but it was a very practical way of achieving the objective of stopping the over-exploitation of stock. By the early 1980s, the high-profile anti-whaling campaigns of groups like Greenpeace and the World Wildlife Fund had been highly successful in giving the whaling debate an emotional dimension that many governments found difficult to ignore.
at the 1980 meeting, there was a proposal for a moratorium on sperm whales. There was no recommendation from the scientific committee that this measure was required for conservation reasons, so Canada voted against the proposal. Canada was the only non-whaling country to do so, and the proposal lost by one vote. Subsequently, outside of the meeting, one of the protest groups burnt a Canadian flag, and our Minister of Foreign Affairs saw this on television when he was uh, traveling outside the country. So he and our minister, the Minister of Fisheries, uh, asked for a review of Canada's policy. And one of the options of that policy review was, since Canada was no longer a whaling country, one of the options was to simply withdraw from the Commission. And this is the option that the politicians chose. With only Japan and the Soviet Union continuing large-scale whaling, and the other remaining whaling nations maintaining only small, locally-based operations, interest in hunting among IWC members was, by the late 1970s, becoming increasingly limited. The whaling nation's fast-shrinking majority would soon be overwhelmed by a steady flow of new and mostly anti-whaling members into the Commission. Many of these governments had been encouraged by the U.S. and some non-government organizations to join the IWC and support the moratorium. When the U.S. ambassador or his or her representative call on you and you have no involvement with whaling at all and it costs you nothing or hardly anything to join the whaling commission, but you have now earned a brownie point with the United States. So a number of countries joined, so we've gone from 14 member states now to 40 member states. Many of those new members not only do not whale, they're actively opposed to whaling. Ironically, nearly two decades later, Japan would be accused of employing similar tactics in order to have the moratorium lifted. In 1982, the sea change in the Commission's membership gave whaling opponents the three-quarters majority they needed for the moratorium's adoption, and also effective control over IWC policy. Scientific uncertainty had become a major issue again, but this time its employment was working against the interests of the whaling countries. The moratorium came into effect from the 1985-86 season. Japan, Norway, the USSR and Peru each lodged objections in the IWC against the moratorium, which legally entitled these nations to continue whaling. Japan, however, later withdrew its objection under threat of fishing sanctions in U.S. waters, while Norway and the Soviet Union maintained their objections but halted whaling. By the end of the 1980s, the battle to stop commercial hunting had been won. But the IWC was about to enter yet a new round of conflict, and once more the role of the IWC Scientific Committee would be brought into question. The whole question of providing scientific advice to a political body is, is complex. It's an important part of the equation, but generally speaking, the people who take the decisions are politicians. And of course they may take scientific advice into account, particularly if it's unanimous. If it's not unanimous, of course, they can, they, they can choose the, the little part of it that fits in with their, their particular beliefs. But of course, politicians also are very conscious of their, if you like, public opinion within their own countries. And I think in the context of whaling, it's become such an emotional issue over, over recent years that many of the, uh, of the political people within the Commission see that as more important than the scientific advice. With commercial whaling at an end, attention was now focused on the scientific committee's efforts to develop a more effective and risk-averse management procedure, as had been agreed as the basis of the moratorium. <laughs> 
the revised management procedure became the centerpiece of the scientific committee's quest for an effective way to regulate hunting. But by the time of its completion in 1993, the political environment of the IWC had changed to the point where the original arguments for the moratorium's adoption appeared increasingly irrelevant. It is true that this is a body for regulated harvesting commercial take of whales. And it is true also that our goals in relation to whales are principally uh, conservation. Um, so the, the, you can argue that there is a disconnect there. On the other hand, the, the moratorium on, on commercial whaling through this body has been useful in in, uh, in a, for conservation objectives, you know, with, without it, um, this many white species of whales would have been totally lost. The moratorium was argued for in the Commission in a very different way than it is today. Uh, the United States forcefully argued that the data clearly showed whales were in deep trouble, and that for most species, hunting should come to an end if we are in the future going to have the opportunity to use these species to feed the ever-growing populations of human beings. Tensions in the IWC by the 1990s had grown to the point where fears of the Commission breaking up suddenly became very real. Iceland's departure in 1992 in response to the growing resistance within the Commission to whaling and Norway's unilateral return to hunting minke whales in the North Atlantic clearly demonstrated the whaling country's impatience with the IWC's increasingly protectionist line. The reason why we did leave the Commission was that we believed that at the time the Commission was actually, well it had become a non-whaling commission rather than a whaling commission. The so-called moratorium was adopted and it was supposed to run until 1990 and then it would be reviewed based on the best scientific findings. And when it came to that deadline, it was quite obvious that a number of countries did not have any intention of, of, of holding that deadline and just wanted the moratorium to go on without any scientific reasoning. With the 1993 meeting in Kyoto came increasing political wrangling over scientific uncertainty. The moratorium was causing enormous tension within the Commission, both in the plenary sessions and the scientific committee itself. The result was the rejection of the RMP against the scientific committee's advice and the resignation in protest of the then chairman of the scientific committee, British scientist Philip Hammond. Perhaps for the first time in, in many years, the Commission didn't accept essentially the recommendation of the scientific committee. And the chairman in particular, Phil Hammond, saw that as almost a waste of eight years of, of his life. And uh, one of the reasons for that was because it was, the scientific committee is the body set up by the commission to address scientific issues. And yet some of the commissioners were asking him questions which tried to imply, not terribly well, that we hadn't done a good job. So they were trying to ask quite small questions on the details of the revised management procedure. And I think I can't speak for Phil, but I think Phil decided to resign as chairman there as a way of saying the system is breaking down a little bit. In 1994, the RMP finally was accepted by the Commission, but not without some strong reservations. Opposition to the RMP had focused upon how it dealt with uncertainty and the levels of protection it afforded baleen whales, such as the minke, a species the scientific committee believed was numerous enough to support limited hunting. Similar arguments over uncertainty and how much precaution is required are now delaying the RMP's implementation within the revised management scheme. When the moratorium was established in 1982 and decided upon, there might have been some valid concern that the scientific uncertainty could, could lead to extinction of whale species. And at that time, the reason was science. But this has gone a long time away. Now the debate within IWC is purely a cultural debate. Is it right or wrong to wait? But the reality is, 
for political reasons. I think the wildlife management community have put a fence around whaling and said that is something which we're not interested in anymore. Um, it's, uh, the whole system is political and we don't want that issue to spill over into the current debate. Issues like the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species or the Conference on Biological Diversity. I think everyone is trying to keep the IWC at arm's length. Since ending whaling in 1988, Japan, under the provisions of the IWC Convention, has hunted up to 500 minke whales each year, in addition to a smaller number of sperm and brutus whales since 2000, for research purposes. Critics claim that this research is unnecessary and is merely a cover for keeping whale meat supplies in the Japanese market. We don't think you've got to kill whales in order to research them. There are very adequate, non-lethal means available to conduct all the research that's necessary for management purposes. Japanese scientists, however, defend their work as necessary for a better understanding of whale populations and how their numbers may affect the status of the world's already heavily exploited fishery stocks. Japan scientists also point out that the species they are sampling from are not endangered by the research and that they are required by the IWC's convention to process as far as possible all whales used in research. If we to make any progress in understanding the whale in its total environment, we do need to study the things like the amount of food that the individual animals eat, um, where they eat in terms of the migration routes, because the whales travel over half the world uh, each year. Um, there, there are enormously important but very big questions, both geographically and, and spatially. Uh, and so, yes, we do need to, to look at the whales, uh, because there's no other way of, of finding out what is going on. Um, but it's, it's an, an enormous undertaking and the Whaling Commission would have to cooperate with many other people, can't do it on its own. The whole question of scientific whaling, where you kill animals for scientific research, is a, a major issue in the Commission at the moment. I don't think there's any doubt that some good scientific results are coming out of these programs. The fundamental question is, do these results justify killing animals? And that effectively is a philosophical, not a scientific question. Since the IWC's creation, the question of how and what kind of science should contribute to the management of whales has been colored by the politics of the times. Clearly, science does not operate in a vacuum, and its interpretation seems most dependent upon the political priorities of the governments concerned. With some of the governments with which I work closely, it's very clear that there's a schism even within uh, the policy of one government. So on the one hand, you can have a delegation walking into a room and arguing vociferously for fishing rights uh, in populations, fish, fish populations, which we know are actually under threat. But on the other hand, they'll walk into a room and, and they will try and defend the whale or, or whale populations, which we know are not under threat. Uh, and clearly, I hesitate to say double standards, but it's quite clear that they, they are prepared to take different levels of precaution for different resources, depending in part on the nature of those resources. Um, for mammals, elephants, whales, people are prepared to take much less risk. Uh, and also, of course, the political importance and the economical importance for, of those resources to the people concerned. The position taken by the U.S. and some of its allies on other environmental issues does not always seem consistent with the arguments used to continue the moratorium. The precautionary approach used to delay a return to whaling has not translated into a similarly precautionary stance toward other environmental issues, such as global warming. And it is contradictions like these that have led to accusations of political opportunism concerning some countries' handling of the moratorium.
Some of the whaling, anti-whaling countries are always talking about precautionary approach for the conservation of whales. But the, on the other hand, if they go to the global warming discussion, uh, they talk about too much of a precautionary approach is uh, actually uh, uh, not in their policy, or that's not the way to handle those issues. The uh, United States of America is probably amongst the leading countries which uh, transform the principle of uh, the precautionary principle in different ways, different form, depending on what is their interest of the day. And when it comes to saving the whales, of course, the precautionary principle takes a proportion which is uh, absolutely out of the definition they will give to the same principle where high economic interests are in uh, play, such as when it comes to uh, uh, global warming and the uh, uh, pollution of the atmosphere. The media coverage the IWC meetings attract each year reveals a confusing array of competing views as environmentalists, animal rights groups and pro-whaling lobbyists all compete for top billing in tomorrow's news. And while few would doubt the important role many such groups have played in the creation of better regulation, there is growing concern that governments are allowing some groups to push the pendulum too far. It's quite clear that non-government organisations have had an enormous impact on um, the whaling issue and the IWC in particular, even though they're not actually allowed into the meetings and are not allowed to say anything. They are always there um, hovering around the environment. And what is happening is I think many delegations are looking to the NGOs and, and I wouldn't say they're trying to buy them off, but they're certainly um, trying to you know, please them to, to get some green credentials because, of course, on many other issues, they're at odds with those very same NGOs. Probably the influence of national agenda such as that of United States, that of United Kingdom, that of New Zealand, that of Australia, are governed and dictated by extreme NGOs, which are animal rights NGOs or protectionist NGOs. And their fundraising activities become national policies, which means that it has a very negative effect on the real management scheme that should be developed either for whales within IWC or for whales and other species within the CITES Convention. Political aspects, even emotional aspects, have uh, come in more and more. There is, there is a position by delegations or by governments that whales should not be hunted at all and of course um, in, in, in the extreme form, these governments are not able, even, even able to discuss uh, any regulations on, on, on whaling anymore, which makes it, of course, rather difficult because basically this body should regulate whaling. That's what it's all about. Because basically this body should regulate whaling. That's what it's all about. As the IWC moves into the 21st century, international cooperation on the management of whales appears more distant than ever. In the long term, the biggest casualty of this conflict will most likely be the IWC itself, along with the goal of more and better international cooperation on wildlife management. Whales, for the most part, occur over a large range and to be managed effectively, we need them to be managed over their total range. And I think the IWC, frankly, is the place to do it, and I would like to see it behave in a rational fashion. Now, I think the deadlock that's uh, happened in there today has to be broken. Otherwise, all of this will be just lost, and it'll be reenacted again and again, year after year, people going away frustrated, not really getting what they want to get. I'm not sure where it's all going to head, but something's got to shift. That's quite clear. Otherwise, the IWC will be uh, defunct. It will be a joke. Whether or not the IWC can break the stalemate it has remained trapped in for over a decade is still unclear. 
but its future will no doubt depend on the willingness of governments to base their policies on the bigger environmental picture. A picture which includes a vision of more than simply a greener shade of whale.